Hello, I'm Kim Eagle for ACC.org. We're here at the ACC 22 meeting talking about meeting uh, day highlights from day number one. I'm joined today by uh, Pyle Coley from Denver and Deepak Bhatt from Boston. Great trials being reported today, and we wanted to cover four of them. We're gonna start with a very important trial called CHAP. Pyle, take it away. I'm so excited, Kim and Deepak, to be here in person to talk about this trial today. So CHAP stands for Chronic Hypertension and Pregnancy. And I really think that this is one of the game-changing trials of ACC 2022, because we don't know what to do when it comes to pregnant women and how to manage their hypertension, whether we should be permissive or allow them to be hypertensive. And we know that the incidence of hypertension in pregnancy has really started to go up as well because of rising age, because of obesity, because of the population. So what this trial did is it really randomized pregnant women, which is a hard thing to do in general, to a treatment arm, which was giving them labetalol, nifedipine, or allowing actually the treating doctors to use methyl dopa and other drugs to target a blood pressure less than 140 over 90. And then it compared that to a standard comparator arm, which was you know, discontinuing all of their blood pressure medications and only treating them if they had a blood pressure greater than 160 over 105. And really what they found was that it was it was pretty impressive, but randomizing patients to blood pressure less than 140 over 90 decreased adverse pregnancy outcomes, including preterm birth, including fetal death, including abruption, and it did not seem to have an effect on impairing fetal growth. So I know that this is gonna change my practice a lot as I'm seeing a lot of pregnant patients and young patients in general with hypertension, but what did you guys think about the study? I totally agree with you. I think this is a, a very important trial from this meeting. I think the number needed to treat was like 14 to have a significant effect on either the maternal outcome or the fetal outcome. Uh, so I totally agree with you. Tough trial to do, but a really important one for our practice. Deepak, any final comments? Yeah, absolutely. First of all, just great to be with you both at ACC and to have ACC Live is, is really exciting. As far as this trial goes, I think it's practice changing. I think it's important to do more research in the area of pregnancy. So I would commend the investigators on that. And the fact that the trial is also positive, and as I mentioned, practice changing, I think is a huge win. So this is one of the trials coming out of ACC, really all our viewers, our members need to know about very important trial. Thank you. And I would also just add one more thing, which is that they really had a very diverse group. So they had lots of African-Americans, lots right. of Hispanics, a lot of the patients that we struggle with often who are higher risk for these types of complications. Absolutely, totally agree. Important trial, uh, definitely wanna read this one when it uh, is released in manuscript form. Deepak, you're very familiar with the second trial we wanted to talk about today. It's called SCORED. Yes, absolutely. So this is a trial of an SGLT2 inhibitor, sodagliflozin, which also has some SGLT1 inhibition. Previously, we had reported from the SCORE trial a benefit of sodagliflozin in reducing heart failure events, and actually for the first time also in patients with heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, something, something that's subsequently been validated and emperor preserved and extended even to patients without diabetes. Uh, so the heart failure benefits do seem to be a class effect of the SGLT2 inhibitors. But as I mentioned, this particular drug, which is not FDA approved as, as of the time of this taping, also has SGLT1 inhibition. And SGLT1 is expressed in the kidney, as is SGLT2, and is additionally expressed in the gut, uh, where it slows down glucose uptake. Uh, and potentially, there's some Mendelian randomization work looking at genetics and mutations, that sort of thing, that suggests that there might be additional benefits beyond heart failure reduction, including potentially on ischemic outcome. So what we looked at here in SCORED was the rate of major adverse cardiovascular events, which was significantly reduced in the overall trial. That actually was uh, part of the initial New England Journal of Medicine publication. But what was presented at ACC was the additional analysis looking at patients with or without established known cardiovascular disease at baseline, showing a similar benefit in terms of reducing MACE in both those subgroups, as well consistent benefits in patients with baseline coronary artery disease, cerebrovascular disease, or peripheral artery disease. So basically, across the full spectrum of patients enrolled and scored, which were stable outpatients with diabetes and chronic kidney disease, significant reductions in both myocardial infarction and stroke, 
absolute risk reductions were higher in patients with higher baseline risk, but even those patients without evident atherosclerosis still had a reduction in MACE. So that I think is really intriguing uh, because it goes beyond the known benefits of SGLT2 inhibitors as a class with respect to heart failure. Now, is this a drug specific effect? Is it a class effect, but we just happen to study the right population? Impossible to say, but EMPA kidney, uh, the results uh, we know from a press release uh, from a couple of weeks ago uh, was also positive. That's also a trial of patients with chronic kidney disease. And uh, we'll have to see, is there a reduction of MACE in that trial? It seems like the, the benefit is seen across the board. Obviously, the higher the risk, the greater the benefit. Uh, and it's been consistent uh, trial after trial. Pyle, any other comments about SCORED? You know, what I would add is I was really impressed by how early that benefit was realized. And really at three months, that difference had already become significant. And to me, that really tells me that there's an urgency to treat even these stable outpatients with diabetes and chronic kidney disease with this class of medications, the SGLT2 inhibitors. And it's not something we should put off until the next visit, but really do it right then and there, because the earlier you start it, the earlier they get that benefit. Great, yeah, great point. Right. Totally agree with you. Now, Pyle, when we treat patients who have a STEMI uh, with revascularization, there's always this debate, how aggressive should we be in uh, approaching the other vessels that may be present? And there's a trial being uh, presented today called COMPLETE, which uh, asks this question. Give us your thoughts about this trial. Yeah, so the complete trial, and I love the name because it re reminds me what it's about, really asks the question whether at the time of STEMI, should you do complete revascularization of the culprit and non-culprit lesions that are significant, or should you only do the culprit lesion? And, and the, previously, this trial has already been presented and was positive for MACE outcomes with a 26% relative risk reduction for CV death, MI, and stroke. But this is looking at quality of life. Does, does doing a complete revascularization at the time of index event improve? improve angina-related quality of life events. And what they found was actually quite interesting, which is that both complete and culprit-only lesions result in better quality of life with respect to angina um, when it comes to revascularization. And that makes sense because revascularizing, whether it's just the culprit or everything, makes your angina better. But at three years, you have more freedom from angina if you get a complete revascularization with a number needed to treat of 31 to prevent one anginal event. So, you know, I'm not an interventionist, but I think that preventing angina is one of the important goals of managing stable coronary artery disease. And to me, this suggests that we really ought to be doing more upfront complete revascularization. Now it was notable that the benefit was mostly driven, in fact, almost exclusively driven by non-culprit lesions that were greater than 80% stenotic. So we don't necessarily wanna fix everything, just the right things. Excellent summary. I agree totally. Deepak, any comments about complete? Uh, no, I agree with all the wise words from Paul. I think that the strategy of complete revascularization is a winner. The complete trial, the main results that were published in New England Journal of Medicine, subsequent publications in JAK clearly show that important heart events are reduced by that strategy, MI, cardiovascular death also going in the right direction, meta-analyses showing even reductions in that isolated endpoint, and now benefits with respect to how patients actually feel. So uh, I think this is a strategy that, barring contraindications, you know, should be employed. And as well, you know, the tightness of the lesion does matter in terms of angina relief. I think that explains, you know, some of the negative trials that have come out with respect to revascularization and angina. If you're stenting 60% lesions, it's unlikely that angina is going to be resolved. It's unlikely the angina is even due to that epicardial stenosis. So, you know, we're learning a lot about angina and the best ways of treating it medically, percutaneously, surgically. And I think in that respect, this trial also advances the field. So yeah, here, the tight lesions are the ones where, well, if you treat them, the patient does feel better. I agree. It feels a little fame-like, doesn't it? <laughs> it does. <laughs> Now, you know, we have all these new antiplatelet drugs that we use for patients who've had PCI or peripheral revascularization, and we always worry about bleeding and having effective antidotes to bleeding. There's another trial being reported today that you're familiar with. Tell us about that study. Absolutely. This is a study of bentrasimab, which is a monoclonal antibody that is a ticagrelor reversal agent, essentially. The phase one data were presented as a late breaker two years ago. Uh, or actually, was it three years ago? Yes, in 2019, and, and published in the Journal. And there, in that healthy human volunteer phase one study, 
you know, we initially showed the benefits of bentrasumab on a reversing ticagular effect. Uh, at AHA last year as a late breaker, we presented interim results in a pre-specified analysis with the FDA's blessing, uh, looking at actual patients uh, treated with bentrasumab, either surgical patients or bleeding patients, although that wasn't a randomized trial. And it did show uh, that there was uh, what appeared to be good hemostasis. What was presented now is the phase two study of older adults who were randomized to bentrasumab or placebo after 48 hours of dual antiplatelet therapy with aspirin and ticagalor. And what was found was essentially immediate and uh, complete reversal of ticagalor's effect using multiple different platelet assays, consistent findings across multiple pre-specified subgroups, men, women, blacks, whites, uh, within the age range study, which was 50 to 80 years uh, across that full range across GFR. So it does seem uh, like it does what it's supposed to. It reverses Ticagalor's effect. And in terms of what's yet to come, the phase three trial, which is about two thirds or three quarters or so done, we just need to enroll uh, about 50 more bleeding patients. And then we will have completed what we told the FDA we do and then see what they say about the data. And hopefully, you know, they will grant it approval, but we'll see. Here's a highly effective agent where platelet transfusion doesn't necessarily reverse the problem. So having this uh, really targeted therapy is going to be an advance for those uh, hopefully few patients who really have major bleeding. Pio, yeah, any comments know. about this? I was just gonna add that the effect was seen as early as five minutes, which I think is you know, really gonna be significant when it comes to patients that may be on these medications that need urgent surgery. And for me as a clinician, it really does add a lot of peace of mind as well. Uh, starting my patients on some of these medications because I live out in Colorado where people are always doing crazy things like mountain biking and, and doing crazy black diamond ski slopes. And so it's always nice to tell them, you know what, even if you get in trouble, there is something out there that can help you. Yeah, and right. you know, importantly, Ticagalor is going to go generic in a couple of years. It, it is generic in some parts of the world already, but it, it'll go generic even in the U.S. in a few years. So Ticagalor use, I think at that point, would be even greater just because it'll be generic. But then if there's a reversal agent, that would be really, I think, an added bonus versus other antiplatelet agents. Terrific. Well, there you have it. Highlights from day one at ACC 22. Amazing stuff being presented and so great to be here in person with everybody. This is Kim Eagle for ACC.org. For Payal and Deepak, we're out. Mm -hmm.